Thought that was kind of cool. Thank you for making it worth my while to get dressed up today. <laughs> Welcome back to the channel, everybody. In this video, we're going to continue our Florida adventure, and we've made it to Florida. We are outside of Tallahassee, and we'll tell you more about that after the beginning clip rolls. Welcome back, and we are at the Tallahassee Automobile Museum, and obviously it's in Tallahassee, Florida, right off of Interstate 10, and we are here, this is a Harvest Host location, so we're going to park here for the night and take advantage of our Harvest Host membership, and tomorrow morning we're going to go into the museum. I've been kind of looking forward to this museum, I've known about it for a while, I've passed here a couple times on the... Uh, Interstate 10, and we always wanted to stop, and then found out it was a harvest host, and said, "Hey, we got to spend the night there. We need a place to spend the night before we get to our next destination." And so we're going to do that, and then go into the museum in the morning. So there's a couple things out here to show you that we will walk by and check out, and we'll show you where we're parked. First, we'll show you where we're parked. There's the Airstream and Monty. So. Pulling in, this caught my eye. And of course, if you're a Star Wars fan, you know what this is. Thought that was kind of cool. Wonder if Lord Vader is here himself. If not, we'll have to check that out. So, this was a different place to stay. Yep. It was nice last night, although we did hear some of the traffic. Yeah, there are parking areas by the road, but not as bad as uh, some places. So. But yeah, it, and uh, it did get a bit cool last yeah, night. Yeah, I think it got down to like the 40s. So we turned on the furnace and it warmed up the trailer very nice. Yeah, we're still having some issues with the water systems. Um, we got the water pump working, mm -hmm. but we we're having trouble with hot water. We think maybe we got a blocked hot water line that's not allowing the hot water to flow into the um, shower and such so we're not getting cold we're getting cold showers not Needless what we want to say we didn't take one today no we took one yesterday it was cold today we skipped right um, worst case is we'll be at a campground with showers and such we can do that but hopefully we can get a fix once we get there too right I hope so yeah <laughs> me too but right now we're headed this is a Tallahassee Automotive Museum. Um, there's supposedly 160 cars on display here. And it's, uh, I guess it was a nonprofit, but it started as a private collection. And I guess it's still somewhat of a private collection. But uh, it's supposed to be fairly highly rated. And it was a harvest host, so we were able to spend the night here, which was good. And we're going to go in and do our part of, of uh, partaking in the uh, host activities and enjoy the uh, museum.
Batmobile. Let's go. Atomic batteries to power. Turbines to speed. Roger. Ready to move out. So what did you think of the Tallahassee Automobile Museum? Oh my god, I couldn't believe all the different stuff they have. Cars, um, boats, they have Batmobiles, yeah. a lot of motorcycles. Um, Elvis stuff, Elvis dolls, stuff. Yep. toy cars, oh movie god. cars. Uh -huh. This is when collecting takes over your life. <laughs> right, right. I mean, there was a lot of everything. Yeah, but it was neat to walk through it. It was. Yeah. It was a lot of fun to see. I always like to look at the antique cars. Right, and it's fifteen dollars per person, so it's reasonable. And it is. Yep. So yeah, we really enjoyed it. Yeah, and it was a harvest house, so we spent the night here, so it was convenient, easy for us to swing in here in the morning and and see it. Mm-hmm. Well, we've walked through the museum, and now we're. Off to our next place we're going to stay. It's Torrey something. I think it's Torrey something State Park. It's in the Apocalocha Forest. I'm saying these things all wrong. I actually know I am. <laughs> um, we'll figure this out. Good thing it's in the GPS. No, it's Cola. Apocalola or something. But anyways, we've got... I think we got to stop at at least uh, Home Depot before we get there so we can figure out some things and make sure we can get the water working. Um, I don't know, you need to stop at a grocery store? Uh, yeah, we could. Okay. So we got to make a couple stops on our way and then we're our way over to the state park where we're going to spend the next few days. I think it looks like uh, not a lot of touristy stuff in that area, but some hiking and such. Maybe we, we get some decent weather, we can take some hikes with the dogs and such. Um, we're there for, let's see, we're there until Monday. And today is Tuesday, so we're there for six nights. Here you can see all the destruction from Hurricane Michael. And there's Hurricane Monty. <laughs> Monty, are you a hurricane? Yeah, he says I just blew in the town. Yeah. We're at Torreya State Park in the Florida Panhandle, about an hour's west of Tallahassee. <laughs> oh, yeah, about an hour west of Tallahassee on Route 10. And this is the area that Hurricane Michael came through and hit. And so you can see a lot of the destruction in the forest around here, a lot of trees down, broken trees and such. It's pretty sad to see all these broken trees and, uh, you know, they've cleared away some of it, but still a lot of damage. Right now we are on a walk with Monty and Zephyr, and they're behaving pretty well. Yep. Except Monty just stopped. What'd you stop for, buddy? I need snow. So yeah. I need to go to the bathroom again? Sometimes. Sometimes I don't think so this time. 
Zephyr's just walking along, just minding her own business. She's yeah. not a very inquisitive dog, unlike Monty. Right. So, the park we're staying at is a, it's a state park, a state campground. Right, Florida State Park. Florida State Park. Yep. It's, it's a nice little park. It's kind of small, not that many campsites. Yeah, there's like maybe 25 or so. If that. Yeah. And there's a couple of yurts. <laughs> Tell Which, them what a yurt is. So a yurt is like a round tent um, that's on a platform and you can rent them. So they're kind of like cabins, but they're really, they're tent material. Right. They have one and it looks like they're building another one. Yep. We have water and electric, which is good because at times we need to run the furnace. It gets a little chilly. Yeah, it's still pretty cool. It's, you know, January 1st. Happy yeah. New Year. Happy New Year, everybody. Yeah. So it's still a little cool and we need to run the furnace. And we're still having some water issues. We're trying to see if we can get them fixed. Um, Problem. So we can have some hot water. Yeah, right now we don't really have hot water working and we need to get that uh, resolved. Hopefully we will tonight. They do have showers here in the campground, so one of us isn't stinky. <laughs> that would be me. <laughs> I finally had to break down and take a shower. <laughs> it felt so good to have some hot water. True. So we are here until Sunday. Uh, but we got, we'll show you around here. We're going to get the bikes out and probably tomorrow I'll go for a bike ride. Yeah, it's supposed to be warmer tomorrow. Today was only in the 60s, but the sun was out. It made you feel better. True, true. All right. So we'll go on a little tour of the campground. Right. So this is the bypass valve for our water heater that seems to be causing the problems. I've got it soaking in the CLR compound, which is supposed to remove calcium and lime, which I think is the problem. It's been soaking for about an hour. I think I'm about ready to rinse it off, maybe use a little of this um, weight distilled vinegar on it, and then see if that fixes my problem or not. I'm the ghost. Not really. Just kidding. <laughs> All right. Thank you for making it worth my while to get dressed up today. Because <laughs> I start at 11:30. <laughs> um, at the farthest part, there's an S kern there, a dog leg in the river that you can see right there. So on the opposite side of the river is where the house originally was. It was moved in the 1930s over here. This 3,200 square foot house. <clears throat> it's got an it got an interesting history, and I hope hope you like history. Uh, Back in 1845, Florida became a state. So Jason Gregory, who built this house, and his father, also named Jason Gregory, had come down from North Carolina. They lived in Quincy for a while, which is not too far away. And there was a Native American uh, settlement over there. That S right there is called a PC Landing. It's even on the um, little map right now. There's nothing over there anymore, but the uh, Native American Indian chief's name was John Blunt, B-L-U-N-T. And so he moved down and became Bluntstown over there. So, uh, Jason Gregory came down. He wanted to have a plantation. He was about 34 years old, already had a family and a few children. Ultimately, they would have somewhere between 11 and 14 children, but only three survived to adulthood. So he comes down, he buys about 3,600 acres, ultimately. He 
picks out a spot over there on Ochizi Landing, and the reason he bought, he chose that particular site was there were two live oak trees, one on either side, and at the time the dimension of the trunk was 18 feet. Oh, wow. One of them still is over there, and the trunk is now 28 feet, and they estimate that would make it four to five hundred years old. That wow. tree. Oh my God. So I'll show you a picture when we go in the house. So he decides to build his house over there. And, and does so. He ends up with about 42 slaves. They raise tobacco, cotton, and corn, and also vegetables for the family on the house. So it's the 1850s. Your steamboats are going up and down the river. There are about 30 regular steamboats that went up and down this route. And that was how everything happened. You bought your supplies there. He ordered the things for his house. The first thing he bought was uh, 15,000 bricks. He wanted to put the house up on a five foot high. I'm five foot, five foot high. Still to keep it from the floods. So he builds his house over there. Things go very well for the Jason family during the 1850s. He becomes a very prosperous man. We're lucky in that there was a young doctor who came down, bought a practice from a retiring doctor, and he lived up in the house here, rented a room for two or three years. But he kept a journal, a daily journal, and he wrote in it lots of interesting things about all the neighbors, about Jason Gregory and his family, what went on and the things that he saw, it's just so much insight that you would never have from like a census record. So we know from uh, Dr. Hentz, Charles Hentz, that Jason Gregory was very innovative, very forward thinking. They said he was just a little dynamo. He was five foot one. He always was everywhere on the property. He said he always had his uh, pant legs tucked in his dirty boots. So he built a pier down there actually almost like a Greyhound bus station. <laughs> All the governors, people from up here at the, in the political scene, the suppliers, wealthy people, people coming down for more land and things, they would all come down and stop off. There was a steamboat stop right at his house over there at Ochizi Landing. So he, he built a cotton gin, a mill, wood mill, a, a warehouse, a distribution center. He just kept thinking of more things to add that would make his um, plantation more more prosperous. They had all his slave cabins down along the river. So again, till the end of the war, he, he did very, very well. Now, at the end of the war, we all know what happened. Um, Confederate money was worthless, and uh, at the end of the war, the slaves had become tenant farmers. He could not afford to pay them for, the, for any crops that would have been available at that time. So basically, he lost the house and all his property over there for the sum of $200. He could not come up with $200 cash to pay his taxes, so he lost the house. And moved his family over to Gainesville for a while, started trying to make a, a living over there. <coughs> they had another round of uh, yellow fever. Some more family members died. Just a hard, hard life. So after that, uh, he had one, one of his two daughters who survived to adulthood. He had named, I have to say this slowly, a Chafalaya. Chafalaya is like Apalachicola. It's a, it's a Choctaw name. He had gone to New Orleans and seen a, a river and a street sign that was named that. And he thought that was a beautiful word that just flowed off, off the <laughs> lips. It means it's Choctaw for Long River. So he came home and um, his wife presents him with a beautiful baby girl and he's his mother. <laughs> We're naming her a Chafalaya. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure his wife probably turned her back, rolled her eyes, and went. Yes, what? dear. <laughs> so she was known throughout her life as Miss Chaffa. Miss Chaffa grew up, became successful, had a beau here named John Grace when she was 15. Her parents didn't really like him. They thought he gambled a little bit too much. So they weren't really, um, you know, putting that out there as a, as a permanent relationship. But the Civil War comes along and John Grace leaves. He goes and joins up with the Confederate Army. He fights for them and he's gone. He goes to Texas. So she gets moved to Gainesville. She never marries, but she did become a successful school teacher. She was able to save up some money, and I think for about $1,500, she's able to buy the house back and some of the land. So she wants to go back to her roots, you know, and she moves back over to uh, Cheesy Landing in the 18, early 1890s. Lo and behold, who shows up? John Grace. He has survived the war. He, he and she could not communicate during the war. He thought she married someone else, rumors. She heard he died in the war. So he comes back to visit a friend, and uh, he's widowed. So the two of them marry in the 1890s, in their 60s. Now, sounds like a wonderful love story, but it only is happy for about two or three years because he gets murdered over there. The steamboat whistle blows in the middle of the night. 
and uh, he comes down to the dock to pay for a shipment and uh, some robbers know that he's carrying cash so they set upon him, beat him up, throw his body in the river and he dies. And Miss Chow is heartbroken, to say the least. But she stays over there in the house until 1916, which is another 20, 15, 20 years. And she dies in this house, but looks still over there. Now, she has no children because they married in their 60s. She passes it to a nephew. The nephew doesn't want it. He lives somewhere else. Uh, the depression comes. Vagrants, hobos, transient people come and bunk out at the house, stay in here, gamble, drink, cause a ruckus. And the place just really uh, falls into disrepair. He sells off to a lumber company. They want to come and harvest the lumber. So in the early 1930s, they come to the state of Florida. I'm almost finished, I swear. This is just the backstory. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. Really, it's it's good. Interesting. It is good. So um, they want to buy the land. So they come to the state of Florida and they say, we will donate some land on the other side of the river and we'll give you this house contingent that you move it. You have to move it. They were afraid that it was going to catch fire and then it would burn their, their lumber on their land. So the state of Florida says okay and, and they get together the uh, civilian conservation crew, dismantle this house, I, I tell the children like giant Legos, okay, into manageable sections, put it on barges, floated it across the river over there and then brought it up through the woods on big wagons hauled by mules. And they reassembled it up here. It took about two years by the time they got finished restoring the inside. What year was this? Uh, 39 when they finished it, 1939. And Ms. Chaffa had died in 1916. Well, that was a challenge getting that across. You better believe it. Yeah. And up through these, through these woods here. But what a beautiful place. So this is the way it looked on the other side of the river. It was facing the river. Okay. So what would you think of the tour? I thought it was fascinating to see each room and the tour guide was excellent in, yeah. in, you know, in what she had to say about the history and uh, yeah, yeah, I would highly recommend it as something you want to see when you come to this area. Yeah, definitely. I mean, even if you're just in the area, come in for the day trip or whatever and check it out. Definitely worthwhile. And you can't take video in there, so we took a lot of pictures and we'll show you the pictures as part of the tour. Right, right. But yeah, like I said, it was very fascinating for that that time period in the history of the house. And it's haunted. Yes, uh, it's haunted. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Yeah. And the other thing was I thought was neat is as you walk through the house, you saw all the furniture that our parents had. At least right. my parents had. I think your parents more. Yeah, the furnishing looked like my parents' house. So it's very interesting. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. Well, we're leaving Torea State Park. Yep. And today is, there's no clouds and sunny, but it is a little cool, but that's okay. Yep, yeah, it's supposed to get about 60 today, so we'll warm up a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Yep. But we're on to our next spot, but you're going to have to stay tuned to the next video to find out where that is, because this is where we're going to end this video. So if you want to follow along and find out where we're going next, what do they have to do, Diane? Subscribe to our channel. That's right. And hit the bell for notifications and we'll send you a notification when we post a new video. We do that on a weekly basis. And make sure to like this video if you liked it. And give it a thumbs up. Right. And we will see you down the road. See you down the road at our next destination. Bye yeah. guys. Bye.